Chini, welcome to um, Books and Skins podcast. Thank you for being here. I know I've been really procrastinating on this interview, but I'm glad that I could actually do it today. So how are you and how's the season going for you? Hi, Sosa. Good afternoon. And Merry Christmas to you, by the way. I am so pleased to be here with you today. I have looked forward to this for a very long time, you know, and I'm doing great. I'm sure you are too. How's your day going? Merry Christmas to you too. I'm actually doing great. Um, The day hasn't been bad. And yeah, I've been looking forward to having you too. Uh, I guess I read it the founder there, the podcast. And the next night I was telling you I want to have a sick guest there and you're like, yes, we knew it. So I'm happy that we're finally doing it. And already, I've already talked about you on the podcast before. Of course, they know that you appreciate that. A wonderful one at that. But then, just a basic introduction of yourself. You know, what do you do? Um, what do you love? And all of that. Okay, my name is Chinyere, Chini for short, a lot of people call me Chini. I am a final year student of the University of Port Harcourt, Microbiology Technology. Um, I love to crochet, I love to knit, I do both actually. I also love reading novels. I I think particularly this, this recently I've had a thing for um crime crime novels and thrillers so but i'm usually a fiction romance novel person and i also love color play i love to play with colors not like as in painting but i just love to see colors i like to stack colors differently i think i particularly enjoy um stacking and rearranging balls of yarn skins of yeah and different colors so yeah basically that's what i love to do those are my primary hobbies i don't really like going out i'm more of an indoor person yeah i like to read mystery and, i like to read thriller mystery and thriller a lot i don't know if i'm a crime person so what but i'll always be a fan of fictional romance although people used to tell me that it doesn't fit my personality you do i'm not usually doing romance yet but i love to read romance a lot and i know right color therapy is a thing i didn't know it was a thing but i started crocheting again just that satisfaction of seeing different colors and different balls of yarn in different colors there's something therapeutic about it and you're a knitter and you crochet which did you learn before which was it knitting first then crochet or crochet first Oh, I learned knitting first and I had just finished with my senior work and I was looking for, you know, my mom and I were racking our heads to think of what I could use to keep myself busy, you know, through the whole waiting period of um, jam and all of that, waiting for admission and also um, a family friend who I consider an uncle engineer known so in Hebrews or suggested you know back then as a little child everyone was going for tailoring hairdressing and sincerely I, I really wanted to go for tailoring because I had done baking back in back during my junior work holidays so I wanted to do something different so I, I figured oh tailoring should be it but he suggested to my mom that oh let's get someone that knows how to knit and you can get the machine for her while she's learning and all of that and luckily my mom knew someone who also happened to be a church member so contacts were made and my mom paid i owe that woman a lot honestly my mom paid and i started Unfortunately, unfortunately, I got admission. So I got admission to study pharmacy in Newport. 
and it was so hectic. So I couldn't continue my classes anymore. I couldn't combine both. So I had to pause with the skill and focus on school. So I learned knitting first, crocheting. Crocheting came after, I think, three years. And I'm self-taught, by the way. For crocheting, I'm self-taught. But with knitting, I was taught by someone. Looking back, you must have been really grateful that you learned it at that time because um, knitting and crocheting have never been things that were common or popular. They are becoming common now. Um, more and more people want to learn. More and more people want to do these things with their hand. But before, it seems like it was an old woman's craft. Like, you are old you are trying to work out your hands, you're trying to prevent arthritis, that's why you're crocheting, you know, that's why you're knitting. It didn't seem like something that, you know, young people could actually do. And from that knowledge of knitting and crocheting, you were able to start up a business for yourself. And I've talked about it before the podcast, how I was, when I left secondary school. I had already known how to crochet, but then but I stopped for a long while. And then when I was finally at university, I kept seeing your status on crochet projects I were doing and all that. And I'm like, I know how to do this thing. Why am I not even doing it for God's sake? And I remember texting you and you were you gave really helpful advice and all of that from your craft you have been able to make um, a sustainable income so tell us about how about setting up your business okay um (laughs) i'm really glad that i was able to make an impact for you for me i know when i was learning um how to knit it was for for me to have a skill my mom just wanted me to have a skill, something that could fetch extra cash for me. But after that time, I didn't know I had it in me to start up a business, you know. I always felt I was not a business person. I was more of a go to school, graduate, get your master's, get your PhD, and be a career woman. And sincerely, there's nothing wrong with that. But I had a major setback and I had to go back to the drawing table and, you know, make plans for myself. So I never intended to start up a business. Till now, it's I, I don't even usually see it as a business, sincerely. <laughs> um, when I started learning to crochet, it was just a form of therapy for me. Like I mentioned earlier, I had a major setback. I dropped out of pharmacy three years into school and it was a huge blow to me. So I needed something to sustain me, to prevent me from going crazy. Because at that point, I thought I was going to lose it. So crocheting and the whole color therapy thing was there for me it was what i used to sustain myself through that whole i call it the grieving period through the grieving period so i started and when i started making products i saw that people were willing to pay for my services you know someone will send me a design and be like oh can you make this and i'll go online or go on youtube look at the tutorial look at the pattern and i'm like oh sure i can make it and they're willing to pay so it gave me that boost it gave me that boost that i could do something that people would be willing to pay for so i started and gradually before i even knew what was happening i was monetizing the business i'm still in the process of you know branding I plan on working on that effectively next year. So I'm going to go for the whole registration and all of that and then get my whole finances in order. So it's not easy. It's not easy maintaining the business because some people 
do not just value your craft. Everyone wants to haggle prices with you. I know that the economy is not friendly, but I mean, this is something I sat down with my hands to do. I put in a lot of time. I put in a lot of energy. I put in a lot of love into it. And you just can't come and pick up whatever price you have. So I think that most people that do not value the craft are the ones that, you know, tend to haggle prices with you or beat your prices down. But the people that know what they are going for, I think they do not bother with the pricing. They know that it is worth it. So, yeah, it hasn't been easy. Um, My business is my baby, my number one baby. I do not joke with it. It is what has kept me afloat. I mean, some little cash for the girl, but you know what I mean. And uh, It feels good to be doing something with your hands and you see someone else wearing something you made that alone is even a bigger therapy for me because you know when you fail at something and then you're trying to heal from it and you now encounter this beautiful craft that you're able to do with your hands and it turns out beautifully well and someone is willing to pay you for it and even wear your product and showcase it to the world. I mean, there is no bigger therapy than that. That in itself is fulfilling. And it is one of the reasons why even when my knuckles ache, when my back aches from sitting for long periods of time working on a project, I want to see the finished product. So I keep going. I think of how it will look on the person. So I keep going. And eventually when I'm done and when I see that, oh, my little hands have made something beautiful and I see the owner wearing it, oh, it feels me with so much joy that honestly, you can't even compre- comprehend, but it's, it is everything. It is everything. So crocheting and knitting, they are gifts. They are God's gifts to me. And like I said earlier, that. I would thank my mom any day. I would thank Engineer Nonso in Hibuzo for bringing up that suggestion because maybe if I had gotten to tailoring by now, I would have dropped it. But I just want to thank them for that insight that they had to, you know, push me to do the whole stuff. So, yeah. I love it. And it's honestly very beautiful to see how your family and friends a major part of your crafts of what you do and how they are propelling you to move forward i feel like one of the reasons why getting a business or starting a crochet business stresses my brain is the fact that people still do not appreciate this art of course i mean i would crochet something for myself because i want to i would crochet something for my friends for my family and friends but I'm not sure that I'm ready for that um, business owner, customer relationships. All of them are very stressful. It's it's one thing for people to haggle prices. Haggle, um, haggling prices is quite common. How do you deal with indecisive customers? I'm going to explain this because this is something that happened to me before. Where someone is practically doesn't know what they want. Um they're like okay i want this thing but i want it in the color blue and you're like okay do you want blue you want blue so do you want it with any other color and they're like okay i don't know yet i'll get back to you and yes of course you get back to me but me who really wants to know if you want to get this thing done when you get back to me i'm like okay um there's blue but I've looked for a color palette. I've seen this video. I've seen this picture. Would you like it with red? And you're like, no, 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 no. I don't like red. I'm like, okay. Blue and white goes well. Do you want white? No, I don't want white. To get dirty. No, I don't. Everything you do not um, you do not want or you feel like. And you're the customer, okay? I have to listen to you. But then maybe you end up um, picking another color that I know doesn't really go well with blue feel like as an artist i reserve the right to to give you some kind of um 
consultation per se and tell you that yes you want this you want blue and this color but how about you consider blue and this color how well let me just say that they are they are being persistent in what they want but then being persistent in what they want might spoil the way the art is being perceived like do you ever have to deal with indecisive people they don't know what they want yet they can't let you walk your mind. um in dealing with indecisive people i don't really think i have had to deal with them as much um most times when i give my suggestions and you feel oh you know better i just give you garbage in garbage out give you what you said you want and if in the process you want to drag me <laughs> i refer back to your messages and thankfully i'm someone that loves to keep receipts so i'll bring up your chat or bring up your conversation and tell you oh but you said this you said that but so far um the people i've encountered they are always open to suggestions you know they want to know which color goes with which and personally too I made it a habit to, you know, when someone tells me, oh, I want this so so color, I go online, I use Google to look at the colors that could go. I also look at the skin tone of the person and I drop my facts. Oh, this color will go well with this and it will look really good on your skin. This will go with this. Oh, no, 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 this won't go with this. So most times they listen to me. Oftentimes, I've also met people that, you know, have their own suggestions and they are usually very beautiful suggestions. So I can't really relate to indecisiveness. Of course, um, I'm playful. I'm really playful. But when it comes to, you know, trying to pick colors or trying to make certain decisions about an order, I try to put my foot down because it's not just about me doing something for you whatever i do for you is going to represent my brand out there it is what people are going to see so i try not to settle for less in terms of color in terms of quality so if you're not ready if you're if you've not made a decision yet on what you want then i'll leave you on hold till you have it you've made a decision i'm even ready to refund your money if you're you're reluctant to make a decision that's that's just it so i don't get into trouble later and then you begin to drag me and say oh this um crochet crochet i didn't even do this this um knitter she couldn't even do it like this no i don't want that to be associated with me at all so i try to make sure that my own records are straight so that when there is a backlash it's going to come on you not me i understand you and as someone who has been running a crochet business for years um, surely indecisive customers or people haggling your services or your art is one of the things you've had to encounter but is there anything you wish you knew um, before you started your business before you started your crochet business and also I relate to that thing where you said um, you've always thought that um, you were mapped out you just have Yes, the MSc, PhD, you know, go ahead to be a career woman. Um, but that's one of the things that I um, used to delude myself that I can't do this crochet business thing. Of course, most of the time I tell myself it's school, and, uh, but I just know that I'm not ready. If I'm ready to do it, I would do it. Surely there are some things that you have, because you, we learn things by experiencing them for ourselves most times. There's some things that you have experienced and you could give and you can give us advice to anyone who wants to start a crochet business you say yes like it's been such a long time i mean it's not 2020 here uh, three years anyway maybe i just don't give myself enough flowers but um i wish i learn to manage my finances better before starting up a business one thing i made a mistake with was mixing up my business money with my personal money i'd also want to say that those early years of your business 
are not the years where you eat your profits there are years where you use your profits to reinvest into your business to build your brand and get things um, fixed up so as a young girl that started a business I didn't know how to manage my finances for whenever the money came in I would feel like a rich girl especially after I I have gone to get supplies and then I still have small change in my account you understand that feeling of oh I'm somebody and all of that but my business was suffering so I had to learn the hard way I had to learn to put back the money into the business you know this whole period where um, a lot of crochet uh, crocheters were complaining about um, hike in Nigerian median and all of that one thing I was grateful for was being able to use my profits to get more yarn because through this whole period I don't remember going to get yarn except a client didn't have the color I am um, yeah, except I didn't have the color a client wanted to use that would be the only thing that would send me to um, my supplier to get yarns so the primary thing is to have goals for your business you know realistic goals not unrealistic ones goals that are attainable and you can set long-term goals but it can be boring so you can shorten them you can split them and make short-term goals that are easily achievable and you see that little by little you will get there you know they say little drops of water make up an ocean so you can start small say okay maybe this month i'll use my profits to do this next month i'll use and then keep track of your finances when money comes in when money goes out whatever you're using the money that is going out for you should be able to give accounts for it so you don't go your business doesn't go bankrupt i'm i'm telling you from experience because um Another thing I experienced, another difficulty I experienced was one time I wanted to make, um, I wanted to start, you know, producing ready to wear. You get so I would make certain clothing or items in a specific color, and then I noticed that nobody was coming for those colors. They would come and be like, "Oh, do you have this in so so color?" And I'll have to go back and get, you know, after discussing the price with them, I'll have to go back and get um the supplies are start afresh and all of that so i realized that this whole ready to wear ready to buy stuff it's not for me since i deal more with custom made products i i tend to just wait so when someone places another i'm like oh what color and that is where reviews come in. you know when clients send you pictures the client another client can easily come and say oh i would want something like this but in so so color that makes it easier than you know investing your money into making an item and then nobody's coming to buy the items and eventually I had to give those stuff away because um, nobody came for them maybe the colors I used weren't so attractive or something I don't know but yeah those are some of the things that I've experienced but at the forefront of it all is um, not being able to manage my finances properly and i'm still working on it but i've made significant progress from where i started to where i am now i can say for a fact that um the 20 year old me that started this business is not the same person that is running the business it's not an easy one but yeah so far nobody has come to drag my clothes you understand and for me that's a big win you know that people get to wear stuff I make and everyone is comfy with it it's a huge milestone for me and I hope to achieve more milestones so with you if you want to start you can start by tracking your finances and you never really know how good you will be at it until you start you just have to just wake up one day and say oh I need to get this done you never know until you try 
personally i never thought i could do it but i mean three years and we're going strong i should really give myself more flowers (laughs) yeah so that's basically it you really need to give yourself more flowers that's why i'm always giving you your flowers um i told my listeners to anticipate this conversation because it'll be a lot of fun and they'll learn a lot because i was inviting a pro to the podcast and i did learn a lot i'm recording this was so much fun thank you for being a guest of the podcast i i should say thank you for the honor of being invited to one i mean I, I know, you know, foreseeable f- future of mine that I think I was going to be in a, po- in a podcast, but uh, you made it happen. So I am really grateful and I'm also glad that someone like you can look at something I do and be inspired. I also want you to know that you have all it takes to excel in whatever you want to do in whatever path you want to venture into just have passion for it just have the drive to do it and nothing comes easy there are going to be down times there are going to be fun times just make sure that you enjoy the ride through the highs and the lows and all of that so yeah it's been fun having this conversation with you I hope we can do this again some other time. Oh, thank you so much. Of course we can. We should never take it sometime next year and do this. Maybe next year we'll talk about books since we both love um tree laugh and fictional romance. So we can still talk about cliche. In any case, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your time. Bye. Thank you so much to dear. Bye. On today's segment of what I've been reading, uh, I said the last episode that I started reading Percy Jackson, the complete series by Vic Rodan. Very interesting, but very engaging book. It's very, I mean, like I said, if I had known anything about this book before I did the episode on Greece in books, I would have, this book would have been on top one. I totally love it. The story is satiating. You know when you've had enough. There are a lot of things um, about I about Greek mythology that I recognized in the book. There are some things that I didn't know. There were some myths or some stories that I had never heard before. So it was very exciting hearing them again. You can imagine that kind of feeling. Um. Plus, the story is um, fictional. So you don't have to go and start searching if this truly happened or if this did. It's not. It's it's telling you something that happened, okay, but in an engaging way. They are undertones of Greek mythology, and if you don't understand it, if you if you're not a fan of Greek mythology, it's not a book exclusive to Greek mythology. So don't let it say, and eh, because they talk about Greek mythology, I'm not going to read it. Mm-mm. So there are like there are five books in the series actually, and I'm done with all five. But then when if a book makes me go to google then that book was really good so i had to google it and apparently there are many more stories about percy jackson and there's a sixth book um the um the first five books percy jackson and the lightning thief percy jackson and the sea of monsters percy jackson and the titans cause percy jackson and the battle of the lambrid percy jackson and the last olympians so, um, the sixth book is Percy Jackson and the Chalice of the Gods, apparently. But after reading the five books in the series, I am so full. Like, there were, there were no cliffhangers. Everything that I thought would happen, happened. Percy Jackson seems to have the nine lives of a cat. Because throughout this series, how he was able to survive is what I don't understand. The story was engaging. And I loved it. I totally loved it. Have I added any other books to my TBL list? No. I mean, the year is already coming to an end. It doesn't mean that I would not add any other one before the year runs out. But like presently, I've not added any new book to my to be honest. Um, I'm thinking of um reading some kind of cheesy romance. I maybe read a beginners before the year runs out. Um, uh, just something that is light, playful, light-hearted. 
that's what I'm going to read. Now, special announcement. Um, naturally, this should be my last episode for the year. I know, I know. I'm really sorry to let you guys go. But a fan, a top fan, suggested to me that I had to do one more episode. I had to pump out content. The listeners deserve it. And you, you truly deserve it. So, 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> Tune in. Okay, we'll just be doing a final wrap-up episode. Um, to thank you for being with the podcast. For sticking with me. And so, see you in the next episode. I'll be tomorrow. Bye.